Um, being your own coach, you're kind of the only one that can measure that. So, you know, or obviously you're not going to be able to go out and shoot hundreds with four in conditions like today, or hundreds with five or six or whatever. Uh, and if that's your training goal, every time you walk out to shoot standing, be prepared to not shoot a lot of standing. <laughs> you know what I mean? Because those conditions don't afford themselves all the time. Uh, I, I will play the hand I'm dealt, you know. Um, I don't shoot a lot anymore. I don't shoot the number of rounds I used to. So when I go out to train, it's kind of, well, I'm here, might as well, you know. Here's what you got. Right, and figure out how to fight my way through it and, and see what happens. Um, basically, I attack each day the same. Analyze my position, make it the best I can, do what I can with what I got. So uh, try not to shoot in conditions that will be a detriment to what I'm trying to do. You know, damn, hurt myself or someone else. But so if if it's a question is are they going to make a shoot this thing, and I'm you know I definitely won't shoot it on my own, but. Uh, to go out and train, this is more training than I've done in the last three years. So, and I've shot 20 rounds standing. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> more of a question, more for the value of some of the I, as I said earlier, I think it's easier to create bad habits, shooting in bad conditions, um, that will only make you a fair shooter in good, in bad conditions. Right. Um, you'll learn enough bad shooting in conditions like this or teach yourself enough bad that come time to shoot in a calm condition, you'll be doing something that involves a, a primate and a pigskin. Is that on tape? <laughs> primate and a pigskin, that's right. All right. So that kind of culminates everything from before the break, ties that off in a knot, answers all the questions that were asked, I guess. Uh, does it address all the concerns we had? Um, I didn't think the standing conditions today were awful. They were certainly not ideal, but I didn't think they were awful. Uh, had we shot 20 shots per with the dry fire, we'd have gone into some, some rougher winds, so I think we made the right decision. Basically just saying that because it was my decision. <laughs> Told you the jokes were bad. They're not getting any better. What would you consider that Perry condition? Some days. Not all Camp Perry days are bad. I've shot a lot of hunters standing in Camp Perry. Not a lot of them are done in conditions like today. Um, let's go through some sitting. Did everybody understand the goal of the training for the sitting drill? What's everybody's initial assessment of the sitting drill for those that have never done it before? Who has never done the sitting drill before? Okay. What did you guys make of it? I like it. What, I've never worked on it. What did you like about it? The fact that it made me think more about having to get back into that natural point of aim and focus more on that first round or the second mag. That's kind of what it's supposed to do. Smitty, did you have your hand up? You've never done it before? Right. Uh, you probably don't have much of a frame of reference, but what would you think? What'd you get out? It's uh, it's all about getting as much information out of what's available to you as possible. I mean, the more information you can get out of it, the better you can analyze the results. Um, there, and again, with with 20 mile an hour winds pushing you in a sitting position, it's tough to say that this one's over and you know obviously a single shot away from the group is explainable but the, the big sh shifts in magazine you know magazines worth of ammunition is kind of what we're looking for and there were uh, a couple that were in obviously different locations but for the most part by the end of the three two and three exercise most people were shooting the three round group right on top of the two round group conditions notwithstanding. So, uh, 
from a guy that was watching it, I'd say that A, we figured some stuff out, or B, we achieved the desired end state. Okay, now the question to the audience is, what changes did you notice that you made to achieve that end state, if you noticed anything? Or was it just going through the motions and doing what you're told? Of the talking points that I have written down as it pertains to uh, the sitting exercise, I have rapid fire mechanics was the first one I wrote down. Um, there are the list of ways to do things separately and uniquely different from the next guy is endless. But it's not like it has to be that way. You don't have to do things differently from the next guy. Just because you want to, okay? I see a lot of people try to perform a magazine change with the butt of the rifle still on the shoulder. And Gravasio, you're one of them, right? Not anymore. Not anymore? I look. Your arms are a little short, huh? <laughs> I'm just... I, I mean, I understand the shortcuts that it seems to overcome, but the things that it prevents, watching the magazine go into the magazine well, hearing the magazine click in the magazine well, reaching the bolt release, seeing the bolt release, you know, d watching the r first round go into the chamber, hearing it go into the chamber. There's certain things that the shortcuts you're taking don't pay off the risks, or they're not worth the rewards of the potential risk that it's hiding. Um, Well, there's, there's, a, there's tips and tricks to, to relocating the rifle butt back in the shoulder that will not only put it back in the same spot, but probably be more consistent than all that moving around behind the rifle butt with it still in your shoulder. Because um, I have left elbow, I've seen people, while the commands are being given, their non-firing elbow is not in position in their knee, you know? There's no reason for that left elbow to not be in position while the commands are being given. The last thing you did prior to the commands being received was to dry fire, to check your position, check your natural point aim. As soon as you lift that elbow, what have you just done? You just destroyed everything. Now you have to rebuild it. Well, 60 seconds is plenty of time to shoot 10 shots, but is it enough to rebuild your position, then shoot 60 or 10 shots? Maybe. Well, why, find, why, wish, why, why risk it? You know, uh, if the last thing you're going to do is check the position and dry fire a shot and be satisfied with it, and then remain as in the position as you can. You know, while you're waiting to receive the commands, um, where we put our gear, magazine specifically. Um, I don't want to single anybody out, but I saw one person who was leaving the rifle butt in his shoulder reaching behind, feeling for the magazine, okay? Well, with the rifle butt in your shoulder, you can't see, you can't take your, your head and move it about freely as you could with the, without the rifle in your shoulder. So to visually locate the magazines becomes more difficult. So feeling for magazines, I mean, just, just seconds that are wasted by the gear not being where it should and our mechanics being a little askew now creates a situation where we're hurrying the shot process, which ends up doing what? When you, when you make your, your compromises in the shot process, do the shots go close to center? Not so much, do they? So the compromises we need to make are to put our gear where we know where it is, to get our mechanics to the point where we can 
quickly break out of position, perform a, 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 an efficient magazine change, and rebuild the position in an efficient manner. Um, to those that keep the rifle butt in their shoulder, what is the, the, the biggest thing we're trying to accomplish with that? Right. I don't even have to look. I just know it's there. Right. I've shot literally thousands upon thousands of rounds. I just automatically, if I had moved that thing over here, I'd be lost. Right. Because I know it goes right here. It just goes. And, well, part of that is taking you out of your zone by having you shoot, you know, this many magazines and do it again, do it again, do it again. So you got to reload magazines and, you know, so I, the, the exercise throws in a little bit of a variable. Now you got to have your stuff where you don't normally keep it. I got it, okay. But it also exposes perhaps a weakness in the way you operate too, right? And, I, and I'm not trying to single you out. I, <laughs> but it was funny. Where's Waldo? <laughs> uh, but but the, the big one I, I saw that really surprised me was the was seeing people without their left elbow down on the knee when the commands were being given. I'm like, let's see how this works out, you know. Um, gear placement is everything. Uh, how many people have seen uh, that guy on the firing line who drops his magazine, sticks the second magazine in, hits the bolt release, and then he's got to come way over here to look through his scope? Yeah. You know, how much time do you suppose that takes? How much payoff do you suppose that guy's getting out of looking through the scope? He just wants to be like the guy next to him, right? Um, yeah, exactly. I've been I've been through the phase where I have to scope. I've been through the phase where, you know, if ciders are good, screw it. I've gotten back on my sissy horse to where I, I like the scope all the time now. If anybody remembers inner service a couple years ago, I uh, uh, shot my first 10x sitting my whole life at inner service and backed it up with a 79 with six as I uh, looked through the scope and I'm like well that's odd I didn't I didn't see him I saw him much better easy much easier last time uh, surely they're in there somewhere and I roll back into the gun I'm like I get this feeling uh, like my stomach's just flipped uh, completely upside down I'm like oh no you didn't <laughs> everything's fine everything's fine no you didn't <laughs> I'm shooting, the gun's going all over the place. I'm not even looking at the sights. I'm, I'm crying. I know what happened. And uh, the target goes down. Sure enough, my target and the target next to me, excessive, insufficient. I'm like, oh, yeah. That's, just so you know, a 79 with six is not how you want to back up your first ever 10X. Because that 179 looks real, that 179 with 16 looks real silly hanging on my wall. Ah. <sighs> Absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. Has to be a part. But, you know, when I said, and that was in 2008, so I've managed to better myself since then, but um, I was talking about, you know, how a, a short break refreshes you. An 18-month an break is not what I had in mind. <laughs> That's a little bit too long. <laughs> it's hard to get the wheels moving back underneath you after that. So, um, now let's talk about shot group to shot group with the, the sitting exercise. Uh, it's one thing to identify magazine to magazine shot placement on the target. But what about group to group? I know some of you were using what, like a minute left, Ricky? Yeah, I just used a minute. And never changed it. Nope. Okay. Uh, so it's safe to say that the shot group should be probably within a half minute of each other, as far as the windage goes, when it's going from 17 miles an hour to 25 miles an hour. Um, so if you're plotting group after group. Were the groups moving on the target? Was your position shifting? Did anybody notice changes in, in the location of the shot groups on target? Not shot groups on target, target but position changing by putting the butt higher. Mm -hmm.
Okay. Uh, we, one of the things that I noticed with, with Stoffer's position is it looked like the butt was getting awfully, awfully low in his shoulder. Because his cant gives me a case of the heebie-jeebies. Uh, to be perfectly honest with you, um, there are things that are not normal in this world, and that's one of them. And it causes me pain to walk past and not say something. Uh, so in an attempt to get him away from the cant or to take the cant out of his position, I started looking at it. And I'm like, well, he does a lot of, you know, steering the gun with the pistol grip, which is easy to do sitting because it's right there and it makes a pretty good handle. And, you know, he, he torques the cant into it, which led me to believe he could torque the cant out of it, right? Makes enough sense to me. So we, we started advancing things. And um, he said he was more, he was usually used to choking up a little farther, but he had to keep his hand out farther because the firing line slopes uphill and the targets were low. You see that from range to range, right? You, you, those subtle differences you see from range to range. What does your data book afford you the opportunity to save you that much trouble right, right from the onset? Write it in there, right? I'm pretty sure that it says location in every, at the top of every page in your data book, right? So if you know that when you come to Camp Bullis, Texas, you gotta let your sling out a notch and you know, don't choke up as much and place the rifle butt higher than your shoulder, those are simple, easy notes to write down in there, right? Can you even highlight them? Circles and arrows and back to each one, saying what each one was. That's, that's, a, that's an Arlo Guthrie reference for you kids in the, in the room. But anyway. Uh, what's that? <laughs> they, uh, the goal of the sitting exercise is to not only check shot group to shot group, but the placement and the shifting position and to really analyze everything about the sitting position. Um, it's one thing to have your standing performance come apart like a Chinese motorcycle. <laughs> but in rapid fire, it happens with much greater quickness, right? When the wheels come off sitting, it is a sight to behold, isn't it? I mean, through the sights or, or to stand and watch. <laughs> You've all scored that guy, haven't you? When you're counting the shots, you're like, what is going on here, you know? And you've all been on the gun when it happens, so it's it's one thing to laugh at it, but you know, the, sh the sitting or the rapid fire exercises is designed to prevent that from happening, to refine the rapid fire mechanics to the point where you don't have to find the magazine, you don't ever forget to close the bolt, do those things to where when you do close the bolt, now you've got 13 seconds left to shoot eight rounds. And it's like empty trophy all over again, okay? So if you're noticing shot groups shift from exercise to exercise, figure out why, okay? Make the parts of the position and the parts of the execution, the mechanical part, more consistent so that your first two rounds and then your next magazine will be in the center of the, or in the desired location, in the suspected location. Because if you miss a wind call, they're not going to be in the center. You know, so uh, what questions about the rapid fire exercise, exercise or comments about the rapid fire exercise you guys have? I made a huge change to it. Probably one of the biggest changes I've done since I've done things with it. Second in my career, I went from a six o'clock hole to center mass halfway through the exercise. Jerry, what was the other one? After you made the change, I was going faster. Something I had tried back when I was probably an expert or sharpshooter. Never liked the center mass position. I didn't see a, a benefit to it. Shot better at that time with a six o'clock hole. Um, today I was like, what was that big skin and primate comment earlier? <laughs> uh, it was it was horrible. And you know, I had to try something. So uh, I looked back at Eric and I said, Eric, I'm gonna try I'm gonna try uh, center mass today. And that's I think it was on my first. What? Yeah, it was ridiculous. Yeah. I'm like, so what is going on? 10. And <laughs> yeah. then after he made the change, it went from 10x on. 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 
10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10,
Does this answer the question? Yeah, I think that it'd be something that we should try. Well, why I shoot a, a center mass hold standing is because it, um, I believe people will stare at the front side post or stare at the target entirely too long standing waiting for the X, waiting for the X, you know. I was having that problem. I couldn't move my finger. I would shoot 6 o'clock. I'm like, can't. I'm, I mean, I'm going to stand up here for 21 and a half minutes to shoot a 20-shot string. I just stare at it too long. I'm afraid to move my finger because the movement looks so great because it's right underneath the target. Well, now that I shoot center mass, as soon as it's anywhere close to the center of the black, pow. You know. I shoot center mass all the way back. Yeah, I knew you guys too, like center mass is got more room for error. So where I shot six shots for a long time, I didn't make a note about everything. Like, okay, if it's right, I got to make a side adjustment. And you burned a 300 a lot. <laughs> so I would say for a new shooter, man, as a rule, shoot center mass and rapid fire because the light's not really going to mess with you if it's bright or dark or the, the different conditions. Center is pretty much center with center mass. You may not wad up really tight jockers, but I mean, I'm a seating guy and I don't have the ability to really wad up the tight jockers. So I'm going for the war of attrition score. I want that centered up group and it needs to be as centered as possible for the groups I choose rapid fire. So center mass at least for me. So just like him, I go back to the six, I'm holding six o'clock, because now I can pump some X's out. Now that's where you're, that's where you're gonna win the match, is the six. So I wanna be accurate as, as possible. I shoot center mass at the six just because of the way that I favor. I don't like to touch the windage knob at 600 yards. So I shoot center mass so I can favor. But it's all about what you can see, you know? Uh, one of the things that was brought up to me on the break that we wanna discuss is, is eyesight or visual acuity. Mm -hmm. um, I just had my eyes checked, and I'm like 2015 in my, in my shooting eye. It used to be about 2011. <laughs> Change is taking place. Well, it's, if you figure your eye's a muscle, my, my shooting eye's probably been used as much as anybody's. Um, but I, I can see the difference. It takes me longer to pull focus. It, it, I don't want to sound like I'm crying, but I see the difference. Oh, absolutely. Hydration, oxygen, everything. It's all its all part of it. But I shoot center mass because the, uh, the front sight post is as wide as the target. His favorite is a joy. Yeah. Um, how, many, uh, how many people shoot a real skinny front sight? <laughs> I, I don't want to change whatever, you know, I don't want to move anybody's cheese, but um, the front, the, the front sight, rear sight relationship is, uh, is a, per, I don't want to say a, a, a visual or a, an optical illusion, but as it compares to a skinny front sight versus a, a wide front sight, it kind of is. Your move, your wobble area doesn't change by changing the dimension of your front sight. But when you go to a wider front sight, it doesn't appear to move as fast and it doesn't appear to move as far. It's the same movement, mind you, but for whatever reason, when I started going to a wider front sight, which is really when I started favoring a lot. Um, I found that my shots were inside a call, especially the shots that were moving, and that it gave me the, the perception that my hold was not only smaller, but the movement was slower. I don't know if it's a problem that either of you gentlemen experience. You know, I'm not looking through the sights for you. Uh, I haven't seen a scorecard lately from either one of you, so all I'm saying is if it's something you're not married to and you got an opportunity to try it, maybe one day this week look through another guy's gun who's got a wider front sight. What a wider front sight does too, it allows you to open up the rear a little bit to gain the same visual acuity of the front sight, and more light never hurts.
<laughs> when I compared the scores from the two different guns, I scored uh, higher with the barrel of the sight. And that's why Maybe it's got a better barrel on it. <laughs> I got gotcha. you, but I get understand, understand completely. Yeah, I mean, you go with what works for you. You know, that's the American way. But do the, my perceptions of what I'm explaining to you seem on par with what I you notice? No, I mean, do you notice it when you shoot guns? The gun go from one to the other. I believe that. I mean, if you if you think about it, it's a more refined aiming reference. I got it. I understand that. Uh, and if it's working for you, please. I'm not. I'm not asking you to change. It's just one of the most. I, I've seen it more times than not. People just jump to the skinniest one they can find, and you know, wonder why they can't hit anything with it. Right. Uh, just something, to, you know, the wider it is, the easier it is to see for those of us with fading eyesight. Yeah, 9 Yeah. It is. It's all perception. And if if you're comfortable with what you see, you know, far be it for me to tell you to change. Uh, I'm just saying that the, the common notion is to go, you know, open a catalog and go straight to the skinny one and the tiniest front sight or rear sight. You know, I don't know what you guys use for a rear sight. I shoot a 46. The 38. <laughs> a 38's awful small. Was he shooting real well? <laughs> well I just, Um, and again, it's not wrong. It's just, you know, these are, these are things that, that people don't ever know and, you know, just go with what comes with it. And, you know, one of the, especially as it pertains to marksmanship or, or shooting in the army, I've said this in front of classes. I've said it to, to people on the range as it pertains to marksmanship in the army, everybody's an expert. Just ask them. Okay. Those, those of you that I've been mobilized with at Fort McCoy, we go out to qualification day, and the most common saying on the range is, I don't know what the problem is today, Si. I always shoot expert. I always shoot expert. I don't know what the problem is today. Then why are you trying for the fifth time, you know? Got the Charlie <laughs> you know, it's, there's a certain degree of, I'm not, are you trying to convince me or are you trying to convince you that you're the expert, you know? So, uh we don't know what we don't know because sometimes we don't want to hear it. Sometimes we don't know to ask the question. Sometimes we're not ready to hear the answer. Okay. Uh, I grew up shooting. The first match I ever shot was with a Ruger Mini 14. I shot that for a whole summer. I graduated to an M1 Garand at the age of 11. Okay. So the joy of going distinguished at the age of 16 with an M14 is a luxury or, or an experience that not a lot of you will ever understand. Uh, 
and it's why I punish myself every year and shoot the M1A match, but just to relive the good old days. There's certain things that, that you survive in this sport when you do it long enough and play with enough of the guns that make you ask questions that when you buy a Rock River out of the box and go out and shoot high master scores with it, you would never ask, okay? Um, when you have to ask, Daddy, why does the rear sight fall down on your M1A because you just put all 10 shots in the berm and three, you know, three yard line, why does that happen? <laughs> well, son, this gun, you know, blah, 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 he pulls out a screwdriver and gives it a click and all of a sudden it's good to go again. In another two weeks, it's loose again, you know, design flaw. You don't understand that at 12 years old, you know what I'm saying? So, um, you, based on your experiences, you know, or where you are on your, on your learning path, you may not have been put in a position to ask a question that you would never ask before. So what size rear aperture is probably not high on your list if you're just now getting into this game or, you know, one of the things that piques your curiosity when you're chatting over a couple of cold drinks, you know, it just doesn't just, that question just doesn't pop up. Normally it's, how do you do this or how do you do that? You know, there's a lot of little details that never get discussed because we don't know to discuss them. There's a whole lot of this game that a lot of people aren't ready to learn because it's painful and it's, it's not an easy thing to do. You know what I was saying earlier about everybody in the Army is uh, an expert, just ask them. The, the physical task of picking up a rifle and pointing it at a target seems so ridiculously simple, doesn't it? I mean, as a human being, as a competent human being with opposable thumbs, we look at that piece of equipment and the target downrange and go, this is going to be easy. That's the first thought that crosses our mind. Yet, when we get to the task, to the execution of, of, of the task, we get run over by a truck. Like, what just happened? Why is this so hard? It's people don't understand exactly what side alignment truly means. I believe personally that across the community of high power shooters, there are probably 10% that understand the importance of side alignment and believe it to the point where they focus on it. Make it a point. I think the, the large in part, the detriment of Army marksmanship or marksmanship in the Army is the lack of understanding of how important side alignment is. They don't, it's hard to explain, focus on the top center edge of the front sight post to 90% of the Army, to 90% of the competitive shooting population. No, you don't have to. Right. You see what I'm saying? Got it, got it, and they don't like that either. <laughs> and that thing's that thing's a real band-aid, isn't it? But anyway, so right now I'm dealing with a, a percentage of the population that should be in that within that 10 percent. You know, I'm talking to people in an audience that hopefully have an appreciation for the importance of sight alignment, right? Can I get a north south? I mean. The, these are the people that should understand the importance of it, okay? But I still believe that when you boil all the fat off of it at the end of the day and you write up your talking points of all the things you want to talk about, how this went good and that went good, at the end of the day, when, the re when you look for a reason that those shots are not in the center of the target or at the desired location, nine times out of ten, it's because of a failure to focus on the front sight. It's just that simple. I mean, there's a lot of people that want to have an excuse for a lot of things, and you ask them the first thing about side alignment, oh yeah, I'm doing that. <laughs> are you? Are you? Are you trying to convince me or are you trying to convince you? You know? So, um, I hope you don't take that the wrong way. Uh, there's, there's a certain degree of what we have to do correctly before we can start figuring some other stuff out. You know, um, most, of, most of you know the name Brandon Green, right? Most, if not all. Brandon Green and I were pretty close when we were working together, and I, one of the things that I told him, Brandon Green grew up a, a daisy match BB gun shooter, not a, not a uh, like a fine work bow or 
uh, an Anschutz air rifle. He grew up shooting a Daisy pellet rifle and that JROTC stuff that the CMP sponsors now. Uh, never shot a round of high power in his life till he showed up at the AMU. Kid knew how to point a rifle, just didn't know how to work a service rifle. So I told him uh, through some, some times we were working on it, I said, if you do, you know, you, you outline your shot process, right? If you do 90% of the things in that shot process, 90% correctly, 90% of the time, you're going to be at or near the top of the master director's bullet most of the time. You know, too many people, too many people strive to be, let me say that a different way. You can go out today, and this is one of the only sports, or it's one of the sports that if, if you have the day of your life, the absolute epitome of your desires on a rifle range, so does the guy next to you, there's no guarantee that you're going to be at the top. Right? No guarantee that you're going to be at the top. I know personally that if I do what I'm capable of doing or give myself the best opportunity for each shot to be in the center of the target by doing the little things correctly, that my name will appear at or near the top day in and day out. Not because I know more about side alignment and trigger control than you guys do, because I do the stuff on the front end that allows the gun to be pointed at the center when I pull the trigger. Does that make sense? So if you do 90% of the things that you do, 90% correctly, 90% of the time, you will see your average increase. I promise you. Because as you work on that 90%, you're analyzing more and more on the things you're doing correctly. Let me sum, sum this up with a close, or with a question. We talked earlier about writing positive notes in your, mm -hmm. in your data books. How many people in here try to build on their successes versus their failures? You build on your successes? Good for you. No. <laughs> we, we, Cooner and I were in the truck driving down here and I asked him, I said, do you try to build on your successes or on your failures? He's like, oh, my failures. I want to do those things more correctly. Well, why don't you spend time working on the things that you're already doing right instead of working on the things that you're doing wrong? Because all you're going to do is keep doing those wrong because that's all you're thinking about. You know, If you work more hard or work just as hard on the things that you're doing right, you'll do them more and more right. You'll do them more right more of the time. And that's where that 90% thing comes into play. 90% is not a good average. As Pretty fair when you look out across society <laughs> to be in the 90th percentile, you're okay. <laughs> but you see what I'm saying? If a 90%, that's an expert card. You ain't gonna win nothing in the high master class with an expert card. But the more you focus on that 90%, then that number will work its way up. You know, because you will start eliminating things that are happening accidentally. You know, nobody intends to point the gun in the eight ring and pull the trigger. Okay, what allows that to happen? So if you work on the things that keep that from happening, if you work on the things that when you do them right, that doesn't happen. Everybody see where I'm going with that? She told me a lot of things about shooting standing. Something like that, yeah. You know, uh, Billy Atkins says, if it don't look like a 10, it's probably not a 10. You know? <laughs> it is. So, <laughs> uh, what, what I'm trying to say is if, if you, uh, when I went to the, uh, one of the Army schools, I was in there, in there with a kid that uh, uh, was a big combative fighter. And I'm like, when you study the tape or replay a fight, do you, you know, do you build on the, the four minutes and 38 seconds of the round that you won or the 22 seconds of the round where you got the, your lights knocked out? He's like, on the 22 seconds. I'm like, why? You dominated the guy for four and a half minutes, you know? You were doing it right for four and a half minutes. If you did more of that, you'd own the last 22 minutes or 22 seconds. He's like, you know, that makes perfectly good sense. So if you do what you're doing right all the time, then there's no room for error. It's not a matter of it's not a matter of keeping from doing the other things wrong. It's a matter of doing it more right.
And that's the, the art of positive thinking. And I think along with that mindset is that once you start focusing on the things that you've done right, those little errors become more apparent. Absolutely. Remember what I was talking about, how when you make your, your, your conscious thought that simple, yep. then there's no room for other thoughts to show up. Yep. And, and when they do show up, when you get the, oh, look, the butterfly, then it's instantly identifiable. And when that happens, the pressure comes off the trigger and you just start all over. It's, it's easy. So those are, that in a nutshell, is what allowed me to be uh, successful or whatever you want to call you know, the, the fruits of my labor have been. Um, Eyesight was brought up over the break. If I could uh, just touch on this a little bit. I, I kind of broached it earlier, but a lot of people get their eyes checked and, and you know, get their prescription like uh, Sergeant Stauffer was saying, and they think that that's what they need to know. You know, you got your prescription, well, I only wear these when I'm driving or when I'm riding or reading or whatever. but. Go through, if you, if you don't mind, about what it takes to get a good shooting prescription, because I've never had one, I don't know. <laughs> um, actually, I don't know if you have that national match, that RP guard guy, he's making rectangular sites. <laughs> Hold on, ceasefire, we're not, no. <laughs> <laughs> but no, um, I called him up, and uh, I'm checking out different things. I'm like, what do you need to get a shooting prescription? He's like, all right, you go to your, you go to your your regular prescription from your optometrist and then you go and tell them hey you want your reading thing done it if you're shooting a service rifle at 44 inches so you got that little card that they put about right here you know that's how you read and he's like put that 44 inches for a service rifle and then you have to go through the whole eye test and he goes it'll probably be between um a half to three quarters of a diopter difference you're plus enough so it's going to be less of a correction so it's going to be Half to three quarters weaker correction, and that's what you need. That's something about hyperfocal planes and this and that. Anyway, I can type this up or we can take notes here a little bit. I just got to find it on my phone. But um, so my my uh, optometrist, he didn't have his little rod that goes out in front. His rod only goes out 28 inches. Like, hey, listen, buddy, I need 44 inches. Well, match rifle shooters at 60 inches, I guess. Um, so we get the tape yeah, measure. Yeah, no side radius <laughs> man's there. Huh? And, uh, and I'm holding it here, and he's measuring it at 44. We set up this tripod and get it. And uh, I mean, for me, it made a huge, huge improvement. Two days before I shot 600, you know, and I went and I get my, you know, get my prescription, and it changed uh, a half diopter. I go and I shoot, oh, wait, no, you know, 197. Good load of exercise. Great, awesome, and I can see I was calling stuff. I mean, mm, that's a little extra like three. Sure, shit, it was. Um, so I mean, it, in the total change of my old prescription versus my new, you know, it's not that much. But it, I can see the front sight and I can see the target, and it just made a big difference for a small correction to make that big of a difference. Just get your eyes checked. Yeah. So at 44 inches. But is it 44 inches from where you put your head on the stock or from your nose touching the chart? It, I'm not sure. It doesn't. I don't think that really matters because the sight radius of a service rifle is what, 20 inches? Right. 21 20 inches, yeah. 20 and a half, whatever. It's, well, the way I look at it, it looks like whatever type of hyperfocal plane stuff, it's just double. Add an inch and okay. then double it, and that's what you need to have it. <laughs> Check that. She's got make sure inches. your optometry has a long enough rod. Yeah, or, or tape. <laughs> or bring one in. Tape measurements. Oh, it's 44 inches. 44 inches for a service rifle. 60 inches for funny guys. Yeah, I don't understand. I, I went and got my prescription done. I said, I see the front side close 20 inches, and I did that. I'm not an optometrist. Um, I'm not saying what you've done so far. I'm beginning to think it's a good career, though. I'm not, I'm not for sure. I can't explain it, Greg, but. Um, it may be worth, and that's saying what you've done is wrong, but no. you've done the best what you need to do. This is like, well, this is sort of, you know, it made sense, and that's, you know, that's, so I, nobody that's what I did two years ago, too. Nobody can tell you what the 44 um, is. I can find a better explanation on, okay. but it's, I don't know. Right. Really, really all you're 40. doing when you're adjusting your, your prescription yeah. is you're making it easier to focus on the front side. Yes. I have lots of different glasses, when, with the exception of I have a pair of glasses, which is the one I tried to shoot last year where the astigmatism correction from. Mm -hmm. 
the different prescriptions, I can shoot the same scores with all of them, but the ones where I have a weaker prescription in it, older ones, it's easier for me to focus on the front sight. So I don't have to think about it as hard. But the, when I have a correction where I can like read everything, I correct the 2015. So there you go, Norm. But uh, when I've got that one in and I can read things way far away, I have to consciously look at that front sight post and think and concentrate on it where, you know, this is an advantage we have over those people with good eyesight. We can back our prescription off to where it's not quite as good, and then that front sight post is just always in focus because it's the thing you can see. And then your target's down there, and you still, it's still there, but you don't have to concentrate um, as consciously on looking at the front sight post. And that's the advantage of shooting center mass. Center of a blur is a center of a blur. It's hard to make the distinction between white and black when you shoot six o'clock. Well, I wouldn't get too wrapped up into having to have the absolute perfect prescription, you know, moving it from the center to up here, because all you're trying to do, with the exception if you're correcting for an astigmatism, but if all you're trying to do is see, you're looking at the front sight post. That's all you're doing. You know, it's not, it's not the difference between, you know, Jerry who might have 21-20 to 15-20, these guys have different things, and they're not chasing around prescriptions. As long as you can see the front sight post, you should be good.